Well, good morning. It's uh, three minutes after nine, and we're going to reconvene the board of the meeting of the Board of Examiners for Land Surveyors. Over yesterday, and we're going to try to complete that agenda this morning. This one's not lit, but that one is, so I'm taking it away from Tim. No, you're fine. <clears throat> okay. All right, we got two. Um, let's see. Where we got, and we'll start with uh, the um, discuss the future management of the uh, TS exam. So, floor is open for discussion on the uh, Tennessee specific exam and and what we need at, uh, knowing that <clears throat> that our exams have gone computer based testing on the uh, fundamentals of surveying and uh, coming up will be the uh, principles of surveying and last but not least will be the Tennessee state specific and what we're going to have to do with that registrants or applicants. Um, will be in tune with what they're required to do and practice and rules and regulations under which we have to operate. Well, I'd like to start with a question from Ms. Nicole. Uh, yesterday, uh, briefly in our conversation about this topic, you mentioned the possibility of uh, being able to administer an examination uh, somewhere in your office or this facility here. Yes, sir. Um, I inferred from that uh, response that you were thinking maybe more of a uh, an individual type exam. In other words, one person coming in and taking it. What would be the situation if uh, let's just pick a number out of the air that let's say we had six applicants that needed to take that examination. Not a problem. Uh, obviously, the the my uh, major concern would be security. Not a problem. Uh, so you would be able to segregate or or some method so that there would not be any security issues. They would be they would be uh, checked for uh, for for uh, you know they'd be checked for you know uh, any. Uh, improper material at the examination site, things of that nature and so forth. We currently do that for another examination. Yes, sir. Uh, well, based on that response, uh, there's, I think, a couple things we need to look at in my mind. Um, I think we have, in, in my mind at least, primarily there's, there's three options um, that we could seek uh, with this. Uh, one would be to continue to administer uh, the written examination, which would be a two-hour examination, um, at a site to be determined, as we currently do, uh, which would mean that we would have to have a proctor for that examination, uh, as we currently have. Second scenario would be that we do the administration uh, in conjunction with Mr. Cole uh, here somewhere in the facility uh, based on criteria that, that the board establishes to do that. Uh, and then the third scenario would be we craft a uh, take-home test similar to some other states or other jurisdictions uh, and that would be sent out from uh, Nicole's office to the uh, uh, potential registrant uh, once the board had approved their applications, etc. I think that's where we're at with this. I, I don't see us making a decision today, but I think we need to uh, hammer out some of these logistics a little bit to see what might be the most appropriate way of to try to handle this. Um, I think the most cost effective for the Alliance Fair's budget is to make sure is to handle it have the have the board administrative office handle it um, we currently have the ability to do it. Um, it, it 
if we establish another contract for someone to proctor it, that's, that's expensive to the board. We already, you're already paying for our services, so you aren't in incurring another expense for us to be here. I, I don't disagree with what you said. However, um, a, a professional examination, uh, in my opinion, has to have uh, credibility, and in order to have credibility, it has to be uh, analyzed by a cyclometrician. In order to maintain that, you have to have a uh, proper item bank. In other words, we're not just crafting a test that is 10 items and we're going to give that test for the next 15 years with the same 10 items. So we have to have, we have, to have a, a credible and defensible examination, which we currently have because we have, uh, you know, it's, it's created by a subject matter expert, it's proctored by the same subject matter expert, uh, and it meets th those criteria. And so I think that, I think that the, the component of eliminating uh, someone as a subject matter expert uh, and the possibility of a psychometrician uh, may not nece be necessary. Mr. Lingerfeld, I wasn't at all talking about eliminating a subject matter expert or having um, anyone intercede with the item bank. Uh, only staff proctor. That's that's the only thing. Okay. So uh, well, we, we would sure still we... need a contract to have someone develop the questions, review the co the exam periodically to make sure the questions are appropriate and fair test the validity, psychometricians, yes, I, I've, I've worked on an examination development as well, just like you have, and I understand all of the components that go into making a test and how difficult that is. So, uh, and I don't have any ability or, you know, internal controls to contribute to that. That is still going to have to be something the state will have to contract for, for the Tennessee-specific portion of the exam. However, um, in order to facilitate on a regular basis the uh, licensees being able to take the test pretty much whenever they need to, because since you're going to have two, t two exams where they're computer-based and they can just sign up once they're approved, the Tennessee-specific exam should be also available on that, I think, on that same schedule. And the only way that that's going to realistically or feasibly be available is if the examinations are, are proctored through the state. Well, and that's, and that's part of the equation uh, that we're discussing here today is, you know, currently we are on the traditional April-October exam cycle currently. That, that's what tradition has been. And the reason that tradition has been is because that's basically what NCWS set up for their initial examinations, and everybody fell in line with that because everybody's going to be at the same place, same time, et cetera. I understand all uh, that. And, and you're exactly right when you speak to the fact that we're in a changing world. Uh, part of it's already changed, and more of it is getting ready to change. And I think part of our decision uh, about the state-specific examination is do we administer it more often than we currently administer it. And if we do administer it more often, uh, what is the definition of that? In other words, does it change from, from the current two times a year to say maybe four times a year, or does it change to a monthly administration or, or even a potential uh, daily administration? So I mean, there, there's, and, and again, the bad thing is, the numbers are low, but the good thing is for examination scenario with staff administration, with the numbers being low, it's not overburdensome or cumbersome to the staff because the numbers are low. Uh, you know, we, we look at, uh, uh, I forget what the numbers are, they're probably in the 50 to 60 range on the state specific exam on an annual basis. So it's not a tremendous amount of numbers. So you know, that's a good thing. I mean, as far as staff administration in my mind, if staff ended up doing that. As I understand the process currently, until you approve the application, 
Um, so the, the process still has to be board meeting, review applications, approve them to take the test. See, so, so, so that me means a quarterly cycle because you only meet quarterly. So if, if the examination were, uh, were approved to be proctored through the state, it shouldn't really matter how often the, the administrative office determines to proctor. Like if, they, if we want to hold it immediately after your board meeting or schedule it a couple of times after the board meeting for applicants to take the test if we need to break it up because there are too many. That should not interfere with any of the board's flow and function because you've already reviewed and approved them to take the test. Well, and, and that's, uh, that's part of the spirit of, you know, we, we uh, hammered around yesterday about uh, our meeting scenario, one day, two day, so forth. You know, as we move forward, you know, currently, in since, when, since FS went CBT, we review FS applications at each meeting because that they're an ongoing, immediate scenario. Well, we're fixing to begin to review PS applications every meeting, which we have not been doing. We've only been doing twice a year for PS applications. Um, and then the scenario looms to match what you just described, the potential of uh, reviewing TS applications every meeting. So the, with that scenario in mind, you know, I, I still go back to the, the two-day thing, but we're not going to beat that horse. We're talking about another subject. But I think that's part of the equation that needs to be looked at for the meeting schedule. But anyway, um, because of, of this moving scenario, you know, we're fortunate that the numbers are low because if the numbers were higher, we, we may have to, might even have to expand our meetings to, to more meetings than four meetings, which we certainly could do. Uh, um, but, and I'm not a proponent of that, but uh, necessarily. But either way, we need to get the job done. So what I'm saying is I think we need to, uh, I think the information you're providing is valuable about staff. But I think the, the, the board needs to kind of hammer out what uh, method of, of presenting the examination, uh, the frequency of that presentation, and then once those two things are determined, then I think these other things will begin to fall in place about the review, every meeting of applications and so forth. That's kind of that's where I'm coming from on it. Why do you have to determine at all what, how frequently it needs to be? I mean, what, if it's an administrative decision, if it's, if it's going to be handled, I guess you only need to determine if it's going to be handled, the examination is going to be handled administratively or not. That's, to me, that's the only decision. Well, if, if you're going to have it handled by the current proctor, if you, if you plan to continue to have it handled by him, then that, then that would be one option. Or if you plan to have the examination handled by the administrative offices, then it really shouldn't matter to the board how often. I mean, if, if, if the administrative matter, offices to, wants to hold the exam every day of the week and available, make it available to the licensees, once you've approved their applications, they should be able to do it. I mean, if that's not that I'm going to volunteer to do that, but that would be an extreme example. But once the board has authorized someone to take the test, you've approved them to do it. Similar, I think what you're saying there is similar to the FS and PS. Once right. the board has approved the application, it's what up to the applicant as what to when they do it. What do you care how often the state affords them the opportunity to right. sit for it? Because I think that it's the board's decision, and the has, board has decided, and we're in a, in a changing environment, the board has previously decided that the examination for a uh, registrant, for the TS examination, is given in April and October. 
that's what the board has decided and that's the scenario that we currently give it under and if we change that scenario we need to make that decision that and just then you just need to administer it whenever we make that decision if we decide it's given in in uh, March June September and December then that's when you give it would that only just to be to limit the ability for someone to gain a license frequent basis I, I don't understand the logic behind that that scenario I mean if they if they have the ability if they've completed all the requirements and they have the ability to move forward why wouldn't you want to afford someone that opportunity well, I want to interject something here too because <clears throat> if we use the proctor rather than you then his time and schedule whether we use the one we're using now or whoever we else put under contract his time and schedule would probably dictate uh, when he could do it because he may not be doing it just for the Tennessee exam, a uh, surveyor's exam. He may be doing it for several others as far as that's concerned and, and doing it once a quarter and or semi-annually as we now do it. Uh, <clears throat> it takes a lot for that uh, proctor to load up, get his stuff together, get an exam site and what have you. And uh, whereas if we did it administratively, this office building is open five days a week, uh, eight hours a day. And <clears throat> so it might be advantageous to, to do that, but I still think I have to agree with Tim. If we set the time that we want the exam given, be it quarterly or be it semi-annually, uh, then that's, I, I think that's the thing that the, the registrant needs to understand that, okay, you have this window in which to take this thing, not some trickle in here one tomorrow and one next Thursday and, and one time. I, I, frankly, because I, I think one at a time that comes in here, it, maybe that's not a problem, but it would be a problem, in my opinion, keeping up for the board, keeping up with who is doing what we've approved the, the applicant to take the thing. But I'm just saying that I, I think as far as your record keeping and, and who comes in, comes out, how often have they taken it, if a guy fails a thing or an individual fails a thing, excuse me, not gender specific here, but fails and they, three times, we want that individual to come back in here and see us before he takes it again. That's my administrative responsibility to maintain a record of how many times they failed the test. I just think that uh, for um, to keep it from having to be spread out over everything uh, time-wise, I would like to have it so that, okay, the applicants come in at a specific time, you administer the exam, and then you're through with it, and you don't have to deal with that. That's just my opinion about it, uh, trying to make it so that it's – you, you gear up for the exam, you have your proctor, they're there, and they only have to deal with this thing one day out of quarter, or one day uh, semi-annually. I just, I don't understand why we would set a schedule. I mean, we've already got so many things set schedule. We've got our meetings set schedule so that the applicants can only get their applications reviewed quarterly. That's, that's already limiting their ability to move forward. And then, they have to pass these exams before they can move forward also. Mm -hmm. So to support the applicant's ability to enter the profession and, and you know, achieve the governor's goal of commerce, you know, and small business in the state, it seems like the smart thing to do is to do whatever we can to facilitate the licensees being successful um, y you know you're worried about like overwhelming our offices but if we have the ability I'm not saying we're going to be doing it every day because I that that feasibly isn't possible but if I could schedule it say once a month for a the licensees to come in and take a test that shouldn't be something for the the board to even have to weigh in and vote on. The, the statute says 0820-1-.03 under examinations, paragraph 1, examinations shall be conducted at such times and locations as determined by the board. That's what I'm speaking to. We have that authority. 
and 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 we understand where you're coming from but we got the authority to decide when and where the examinations are given and we're tr we're trying to to understand how if we do them in this building under your purview that they will be uh, secure and properly administered and so forth that's really all we're asking you know uh, to make sure because you know we have not we have no knowledge or I have not let me say that I don't want to say we I don't want to include everybody I have no knowledge of what exams you currently administer I have no knowledge of how they are administered or their security or or any of those factors relative to that examination I have no knowledge of that so so I'm just trying to ask questions so that I can learn uh, of how those are actually done uh, how they're they're managed uh, how another board under your purview uh, does this type of work so that that I can feel comfortable that that that's the decision that I would lean towards is having uh, someone in your staff uh, for you know do the examination uh, with all the other P's and Q's and I know you know what those are uh, taken care of to make sure that that's okay and then that way uh, once I understand that then that helps uh, craft a decision that this board can make uh, relative to to you know uh, when and where how often and these type of things because because again we still face this situation of this moving target see we we have gone from a complete paper and pencil scenario of where you could t have taken all three examinations in a two-day period at a testing site to now to where you qualify to take the FS, it's at another testing site on my own computer. Uh, the PS is getting ready to come up with the same situation and they're going to be instantaneous basically once you know, are able to, go, to get approved and get a seat and so forth and so on. And then now we have our test that like all the other jurisdictions in the United States has been pushed to the side by NCWS and says, you know, good luck, y'all handle it. Well, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to handle it because we know that as far as our proctor uh, and our exam man, uh, his contract runs out in March of 2017. The last administration for him, paper and pencil, will be April of 2016. Uh, he is uh, on contract to administer in October of 2016 if we, if we don't change our methodology between now and then. So we, we know these facts. So we know that from a standpoint of the the uh, TS examination, we're in good shape right now through October of 2016 by our current contract. Okay. But what we're trying to do is be have enough foresight in front of us to, to make that change, maybe even before 2000, the October 2016. Can I answer your question? Yes, ma'am. All right. Dennis, can you describe how we proctor the geology examinations? We proctor two examinations for geologists of fundamentals and uh, a principles of ge uh, geology examinations. We are in touch with the folks who actually designed the exam. Uh, we send them a list of everybody who gets approved, and they send us all the specific materials, FedEx, very secure packaging. We invite them to come down to our offices on a date, and we've had up to eight, sometimes ten people on the sixth floor because it's a Separate them, no problem. And uh, we read the instructions exactly as we're supposed to, and we monitor them for up to seven or eight hours in a day. They have a morning session, then they have an evening session, and after that we have very specific instructions as to how those have to be collated because there are six or seven different pieces to an exam, right down to their notes have to be sent back. You know, they're not even allowed to take notes home. They even send us pencils that they're supposed to use. They're not even allowed to use their own pens and pencils. So to say that it's done in minute, minuscule detail is just putting it mildly. We follow every instruction that they're supposed to, that we're supposed to. And uh, we've been doing this successfully for a number of years. So in terms of security, in terms of having them, you know, sort of do the test the way it's supposed to be conducted, I think I think we have no problem doing that. 
good. That's no good. problems that's, at that's all. What, that's what I've been wanting to hear. I mean, yeah. that's good. Uh, how, how often, what's the frequency that you give the geology exam? It's actually quarterly right now. Okay. It, it's quarterly right now. But I think where, you know, our director was going with this was once the board approves, let's say, 15 people to do it, we could have them in here lickety split and just say, you know, here's your opportunity to get this out of the way and just have them come in rather than say, well, you've got specific times in which you can come take this. You, you have, uh, uh, is that the only, uh, do you administer the appraiser's exams and uh, what, how many other boards uh, do you administer exams for right now? Just the geology exams currently. Uh, the uh, appraiser. Only reason I was asking because the more and more that these boards and you have what 17 total boards, are, whether they come under you directly or what have you, the potential is you could have 17 exams that you'd have to administer. But I would hope not. Uh, I, a lot I, of the programs don't have examinations, their <coughs> registrations or their companies, or you know, wouldn't. Yeah. You don't test a company. Yeah. And, and that's fine. I, I, but I was just saying that that hey, if you did have, then here's just one more that we're adding to this. And so I think it is up to the board, I, and I have to agree with him, that, that we we set the frequency, and then when you administer, you just only have to gear up for one day a quarter or one day semi-annually to get it in and get it done with, and then you're so, uh, You might be setting more onerous on our staff than you are intentionally doing. You might actually be creating more of a burden on us to meet that deadline. Well, I think that in that spirit, maybe uh, a good a good trade-off would be that once the board approved an applicant to take the TS examination, that we could give them a one that one year window, they would be able to choose whatever opportunity that exam opportunities in other words if we if we said quarterly to Dennis said quarterly if we said quarterly they'd be able to choose for example if they didn't want to take it if they got approved in January and they didn't want to take it in the first quarter they could take it in the second quarter uh, because the the man seems to me the management for you all would be just knowing how many numbers you have to make sure that you have all the proper materials, uh, it, you know, staff if it needs to be more than one for some reason. But, you know, again, remember, we're only talking about a two-hour examination. So, I mean, ours is, is much different because you spoke to a seven, eight-hour examination. So ours is much different than that. So, it's, you know, it's, it's a much smaller uh, time requirement uh, for your staff, which is a good thing. That's a good, you know, the numbers are low. The time requirement is, is minimal two hours you know obviously it's going to take longer than two hours mm -hmm. you know time you prepare <laughs> them speak to them mm -hmm. give it to them and then collect it and so forth it's probably going to take three hours or so you know so but still it's a minimal requirement it's less than a half a day let's put it that way so you know that that's what i'm kind of seeing is that that you know uh in this process again we're plowing new ground as we say up home uh and and in doing so we need to be a little more foresight with you know, uh, like NCWS, you, you, you apply for the FS, you've got a year window to take it. You know, any time in that year, you're good. You're approved, you're good, you can take it. And maybe we need to consider something like that uh, in, in the situation. Yeah, I'm, I think I'm starting to hear some, some mutual agreement here between the two sides here, which, which is good. Um, the, the thing I like to compare this to is, is the state of Kentucky. All right, we, we've talked about this before. Um, generally speaking, the way my understanding that they handle their state-specific exam is basically when they get enough applicants approved, the application process is no different, they approve to take the state-specific exam, administratively when they get what they deem enough applicants, basically not a single applicant but not a dozen either, let's just say five, five or six, something to, you know, quote, worth their time and effort and expense. Then they set the date. It's a flexible date. Hey, we just got our six one. Let's set a date. They set a date. They contact the applicants that have already been approved. Hey, we're going to have it on you know two weeks from today or, or whatever it is. Come I, on up I and think, take the exam. I think that's it, exactly what Nicole was going with. You know, it, I, just I, I once the board is. approves, let's say and, and even six speaking, or eight people, you know, in one of your yeah, meetings, and, and it works out to be just because we just like Tim put said, them together, set a low, date, and have the exam. Exactly. It works out to be about quarterly. 
Okay. And it's because, like Tim said, you know, the numbers are low. There's no, there's really no reason or justification to bring in a single applicant. You know, that's that's just kind of nitpicky. Yeah. But at the same time, you don't want to wait six months when you're going to get overloaded with maybe 20 or 30 or something that administratively is, is you know, somewhat of a burden. I know you could handle it, but a little bit of a burden. So I, I think what we need to be is, is, yes, there needs to be a date, but it needs to be somewhat flexible based on when we get five or six approved applicants that come through. Um, you know, sometimes it may be more, sometimes it may be less. But, um, you know, perhaps it should be, uh, you know, Upon you know approval of uh, the application, uh, administratively they they deem enough numbers to make it worthwhile, but no less than quarterly. Because what I would what I would not like to see is a kind of a safety net here. Let's say we just get three over a six month period. Well, those three are waiting and they're waiting and they're waiting, and, and that's not fair to them. You know, Nicole, you made a good point. Why are we waiting? It's not fair to them. So so perhaps uh, you know no less than quarterly, but when deemed appropriate by administratively on, on approved applications. That way, that way it's, not, it's not immediate individual, but administratively it can handle a small group, it's efficient, but at the same time we put restrictions in there, no less than quarterly is it offered uh, to those who have qualified, uh, and that way they're not being held up be right. just because the numbers aren't there. Right. And I, kinda, think, I think the frequency thing both ways. that Nicole spoke about, I, I think that there's a point in time we'll get there. I really do. I, I think I think that we will get there. I don't. I just don't feel. We've got some. Let me say it this way: in our current licensing law, we still got some sunset language and stuff in there. There's some things going on in there that we've kind of got to get through in, in the next uh, 18 to 24 months. I think once we get through those, I think that we'll be much closer. And also, once <coughs> the PS exam has its track record going with the CBT. Uh, I think we'll be much, much closer to where, where you're wanting to be. But I, I, think, I think we need to grow into that I th because we're making a pretty good leap here. Uh, I, think we need, I don't think we need to take you know, a giant step. I think we need to take a smaller step uh, and a controlled step to, to make sure that not only the board, but, but you and your staff are comfortable with the procedure and routine that we choose to use so that we can move forward. One of the things that uh, the board might want to consider is um, something that the appraisers have laid out in their rules for examination is that an exam one year from the date of approval to take the test it doesn't say quarterly but they get it gives them four chances to take the test and one year and if you take it twice during that year, or if you take it four times during that year, you only get four shots and you only get one year. And after that, you have to reapply. And also, you have to wait until that year lapses before you can reapply. It's just that don't even come back. If it's nine months and you've already used your four times up, you're going to have to wait until the year is up before you reapply to, to cycle out. Cause you have obviously not studied hard enough, so you need to spend a couple months. <laughs> yeah, and and unfor unfortunately, the system has to cater to that problematic uh, test testee is what it has to cater to because the the good ones they're going to do the right thing. They're right, going to move right. right on through. You know, when we don't, and you know, clearly you said it earlier. We don't hold anybody up, but but at the same same token, I, I think we just need to take a small step. But I, at the end of the day. At the end of the day, I will agree with you, that's where we need to get to. But I'm just not 100% sure we're ready to make that giant leap just yet. Let, let me uh, interject one thing real quick, because this all started with, you know, there was three options we could administer the exam. I, 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 I want to come out of here with at least some kind of mutual understanding of the way the, the, take, the excuse me, state-specific exam would be administered. The options were obviously a, an outside proctor, outside uh, location. Second example would be here administratively. Third example would be uh, a, a take-home exam. Um, I'd like to be able, and, and all the discussion here has been about offering the exam here right. at, at the headquarters administratively, which, which honestly I'm, I'm comfortable with. Um, uh, I, I see some merit behind the take-home exam personally, um, but, but I'm, I'm very comfortable with uh, having it administered here. It does make sense. It does make sense. And it does give a, a more sense of security to the exam and the whole process over a take-home exam. Right. Um, 
that's a whole other argument. But what I'd like to do basically right now is, is in, in an effort to make some progress on this, because this is obviously a, an ongoing thing that's going to take some time, um, can, can we come to a decision today, uh, here soon hopefully, about the way the exam will be administered in terms of at least location, at least location? Because we had three options, um, and I'd like to be able to, to wrap that down so we've got that decided, and then we'll get in and start getting into the details of how. Um, and, and, and quite honestly, I'm comfortable right now with, with having being administered here at, at the location that we're at here at the board offices. Um, is that something that, that we can all agree on just to start with? Well, from that standpoint, but it, as far as, as that type of exam, but if we decide that, it, that we want to go a take-home exam mm -hmm. type thing, the then, uh, then we're looking at something different as far as uh, administration and what have you. So. Uh, uh, those are a couple of options. Well, we are, are we going to go with a, a proctored exam? Or are we going to go with take home? Did they go home and do it and say mail it to them? We, be mailed to mailed them. To we, them. We, would, we mail the exam to them. It's already prepared, and no two uh, applicants get the same exam. Mm -hmm. But when you know they have to do it, work on it, and then they send it back. And it's not just on the book, but there there are problems and things to work out, and et cetera, that type of thing. We haven't decided the form of the exam yet. That, that's what I'm trying to get at right here, is if we can come to a, to a conclusion right now, let's, let's come to a conclusion on what the form of the exam is going to be, and then let's start working on the details. Because right now, we don't even have a, a consensus on how we're going to administer the exam. I mean, we're, we're running a proctored exam uh, because we have a contract right now. Right now, yes. Right. Yes. Right. But, that's all, but that all stops. Well, if, but, if but we, we'll still have, But we will still have, uh, even if we decided right now to go with the scenario we're generally discussing about right. half administering exam so forth and so on right. we are still going to have uh, a outside expert involved with exam preparation because you when you give it in that scenario you've got to have enough item bank items so there. that you've got I'm multiple exams so forth and so on so uh, all of that's still going to be there but you're exactly right we need to we need to focus on this point that's right because there's a whole lot of factors that go with it and those factors we can hammer out if it has to even be the next meeting but if I think I think we can come armed for the next meeting with uh, those questions and those concepts yep. uh, if we know what direction we're going to be pointed towards you're, you're right and again that's kind of expanding beyond where I'm trying to right. focus us in on I, I agree with Jay I think we should let these be I agree with the offer of, yeah, of Nicole I, I th I th being able I to provide proctor and you know, security. What exactly, Nicole has told us and what and Dennis, Dennis absolutely. I, I'm very comfortable with what y'all told us. Yeah, I mean, hearing the know. details from how the how y'all administer the the with geology board that that to me was like there it is right there that very that different. sums it up. You know, I, I just needed some more confidence in that we all have an understanding of the value of the security of the exam, right. the administration of the exam, and, and obviously it's 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 there. So they're I'm never left with that. alone for a single. No, they're never left alone, okay. and even after the exam. They give us a pre-packaged FedEx box, and I have got to put that in by the end of the day. You can't even keep it with you overnight. <laughs> it's, but we, we, we do it all the time. The, pre, the, the geology preparer grades the exam. Okay. They prepare everything. They give us all the materials. They give us the booklets. They give us the pencils. <laughs> All we do is read the instructions and watch the applicants. You know, because the first sheet is a little computer sheet where you right. got to fill in little zeros right. like your state, right. you know, uh, sure code. Make sure their names are correct. Make sure their their identity is properly filled in on that little sheet where you just fill in little zeros. So we guide them through that, and then there's a portion that you have to elocute. You read it to them, make him do it. Read it to them, make him do it. And then of course you just watch them doing it. And then they take a brief lunch break. They're not allowed to take anything with them. No backpacks, no phones, no nothing. <coughs> Leave everything in the back of the room. Take your wallet, take your card, your debit card, go for lunch and come back. You're not taking any of your backpack home with you. I mean, it's just like security. I mean, it's exactly. Is, so doesn't, doesn't it's not, you know, that, you know, you can't even have cell phone. Yes. Will they go, you know, over the lunch break and chat with each other about what they've read? Most likely they will. But then they're not writing anything. They don't have anything to look up because everything they do in the first section is handed in, and that's it. You're done with that. 
Nicholas when you come back in the afternoon, it's a whole different ball game. Yeah. You're not playing with the same stuff you had in the morning. Our exam is a little simpler security-wise because it's only a two-hour exam. Yeah, so they come a, in, they do it, they window. leave. Exactly. It's much easier to control. That one is a part one test and a part yeah. two test. Right. So they're, a, they're, it's two different tests. Right. Yeah. So you, know, you have a morning test and an afternoon test. So they couldn't really go back and you know, look up the answers for the part one because they are never going to have their hands on part one again. <laughs> I will make one other comment and uh, before we decide uh, that we are going to do this. I will say that having a proctored exam and having listened to Mr. Cleveland yesterday and the concerns that were expressed concerning a quote take home exam, uh, I think this would appease those folks in the professional organization to say, hey, you're sticking with a proctored exam and, and we like that quote maybe better. It may be that at some point uh, after we go through this thing for uh, a year or maybe a quarter or maybe five years or whatever it is, we may want to go to a take home exam. But right now, I think uh, that TAPS would feel better and those that had some concerns, because I, I don't have any concerns one way or another. I think that when we administer the exam that it'll be a thorough exam that will cover everything that the board thinks to me be covered and it will be everything that will be in our book <clears throat> so from that standpoint I'm, I'm okay with the proctored exam I don't have a bit of problem with that and I don't have done administratively right here without having to hire a, a doctor to do that so I'm going to make a motion on that so now then I will entertain a motion to I'll give it a try. Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and make a motion that the uh, that the future Tennessee state specific exams beginning on October of 2016. No, let's let's don't put a date in there. Let's uh, let's a after the April 2016 exam. Let's just say after the April that? 2016 exam. Let's after give us some flexibility that's right. and not tie us down by date. If is that's to be, okay. Yeah, is to be administered uh, administratively at this location or the, at the board's location, I should say. Um, as a proctored exam. Uh, yeah, as a proctored exam with the required security procedures, et cetera, um, for those applicants who have been approved by the board to take the Tennessee specific exam. With the dates of the exam uh, being no less than quarterly. Well, let's don't, let's don't throw that in. Let's, 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 let's make the decision to, to do it, with do the it date, here. With the and dates then to we'll be decided then we'll by beat the out, board. Then we'll beat all, all that stuff out. Okay, yeah. Okay. Not that I disagree with what you're saying at yeah. all, but let's I, I see where you're going. I see where you're so I'll just I'll rescind that part of it. Because that's what you part. wanted to do to, in, in the beginning, I think, with your motion. It is, yeah. Was, yeah, I don't want to get specifics on it. Let's get format, and then we'll work details. You're correct, yeah. So there's the motion. Okay. Uh, Second. Okay. Okay. One more time. Dennis, what do your notes say? <laughs> <laughs> Tennessee-specific exam after April 2016 will be administered in-house by staff. Yes, I, good. I think that's really good. <laughs> you didn't want to put in anything else. Did I say that so well? You didn't want to put dates, you didn't want to put time. No, I, I took out the things no, that yeah. you were no, not. That's fine. Yeah, you're fine. Yeah, because, I, just, I think we just need to hammer that stuff out. Yeah, and then the details yeah. of how and yeah. when and why. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is a major decision here, and then, then we'll get into all the details. Yeah, because right I, I believe now you've got a target. You yeah. know how you're going to do it. Right. Now you decide the modus operandi, so to say. Okay, motion's on the floor. Uh, do I hear a second? We had one second. Oh, yeah. oh, I already did. I'm she done sorry. jumped in there. I'm, I'm, I have turned my hearing aid on on that side. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, any further discussion? All right, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. That takes care of that. Now where do we go next? Still anything that we need to have wise other than what we have already done with the details I think uh, I think we probably need to do that on our individual basis uh, with some ideas uh, bullet points things like that and bring those to the next meeting and kind of consolidate those together and hammer those out uh, that way just put an agenda item on the next, the next otherwise meeting. we'll be here for another three days hammering this this right. topic out trying to get details and, well it's still green to us it is it's still green and, we, and we've made a big decision and and you're right. I think we need to I'd think like, about it. I'd like to do some research on my own with some other states that yeah. administer theirs administratively through their offices and see what works, what doesn't, and then uh, and then when we convene next meeting, we'll we'll get those together.
probably as fair as it can be done for the applicant so that, that no applicant feels like that he's something and having to wait and wait and wait uh, that they, they can be taken. All right, next item. Let's see, did we cover what we need to cover on the update on the NCWS yeah, uh, yeah, thing? Right there. Good there. And the GPS topic needs to come back, I think. Can, uh, can we interject that one before the GPS? Are we talking about Josh? The, 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 the principal? Yeah. Okay. Since Josh uh, is here, he may have to go or something. Uh, are you in a hurry, Josh? Okay. okay. No, I'm but, here. But, here all day. But let's, let's go ahead now, uh, and we're going to say discuss the definition of principal as used in the rules of conduct, right? right? Okay. So, Josh, we await your okay, professional I guess, expertise witness. Um, I guess I'm just a little bit confused because I was looking at that one ahead of time yesterday and thinking I don't really know that we need to define it further because I thought we were just going with the traditional legal definition of principle as used in uh, the course of business or commercial, commercial law. So I don't, what is, um, I guess I need some explanation from the board or direction from the board about what is the potential confusion or what do you guys see as the confusion? Okay, the, uh, I've been contacted by quite a few registrants. Uh, and obviously this is a new, new thing for the registrants in our state registering their firm and registering uh, who is in responsible charge at each particular office. The question bodes around the fact that uh, a licensee can be in responsible charge in a particular office but not be a principal in the company or the corporation, whatever the structure of the entity is. And that, that is the principal question. Well, I shouldn't use principal. That is the question because that's what we're trying to answer. That is the question. and. You know, we addressed this, uh, began to address it. Uh, I think you presented a policy draft uh, to us in April, I believe, if my notes are correct. Uh, it came from somebody, it didn't, it didn't come from, from me, I know that. Um, and part of the discussion was about the possibility of using the same uh, language that the engineer and architects have in their uh, rules and my notes tell me that we were going this would be to be discussed at this meeting uh, in order to determine how it would be handled that's what I had in my notes collection of that exactly but I can get very easily the engineers definition I have it here if you'd like to have oh. a copy of it. Okay. Yeah. I can just take a look at it. We're saying doing a rule change and adding these points. Uh, I, I think uh, I don't think we're going to do a rule change, Josh. I think we just need to do a clarification for the registrants. I think our rule is is fine, but we didn't we did not put a, a definition in that maybe we should have included. Yeah. So I mean, I just so all we're doing is just trying to clarify a point. Yeah. I'm just saying it would be good if we had a definition in the rules. Um, if you if you feel that's necessary and it's not a, a daunting task, then we certainly can do that. But either way, my goal is is so that the registrants will be able to to basically understand that it's the same meaning that it has been in the past that we want a licensee in every location. Right. That's responsible just for that location, not for multiple offices.
Oh, I've got it. You got, got it. it now. Okay. Under 4.09. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I see bullet point two there. I mean, so, or part two, um, the officer, principal, and responsible charge must be registered in the profession in which services are being offered. Okay. The, the key there with the registrant's question has been, if I'm an employee and I'm a registrant, I can be over that office. I can be in charge of that office, but I am not an officer of the company, nor am I a principal of the company. That's that's the key question. Yeah, I read the rule. I mean, I'm just speaking kind of off the cuff, but um, if they're a registrant, but they're not an officer or principal of the company i'm not sure <laughs> that the rule says that they can be in responsible charge because it says only officers and principals mm -hmm. who are employed full-time for a minimum of 30 hours per week so i mean the way i read that they either have to be an officer or a principal that's the problem is, what's problematic with that is that's not always the case uh, for example, uh, Jay works at a rather large company, and he, if he decided to have a satellite office here in Nashville, for example, uh, he would place a surveyor here if that's what the work they want to be doing, and that surveyor would be in charge of that office. He would still work for Jay, but he would have a surveyor here in responsible charge of this office. Well, that individual may have nothing to do with the corporate structure of Jay's company as far as he might not be a a vice president or he may not be uh, you know an owner uh, or anything of that nature and that's that's where the clarity comes in uh, and and it may be that 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 uh, we overstepped a little bit when we approved that specific language but I think that we have an opportunity to clarify that um, yeah I mean it's the you know it's the board's uh, responsibility and certainly within your authority to interpret your own laws and rules I just uh, the way that that reads and I mean after having this discussion I understand what you're saying I'm just saying that if I had just read that I would have assumed that they would have had to be one or the other and that's um, what the registrants are, are saying back to us. right mm -hmm. and uh, I mean I don't think that it hasn't really come up in the form of a complaint or anything yet, so it's not like we've been disciplining or opened any complaints against someone for being a registrant in charge of an office but not a principal of the company. But typically speaking, what happens is, is just actually the opposite, is a registrant having two offices and only having one registrant. That's, uh, that's, that's the typical right. uh, problematic so, disciplinary situation right. that, that we've seen in the past. And, okay. that, and that's where that's where it's problematic to to the local registrant. Um, John Doe has an office in in this town, and there's two or three other little small towns around. And uh, he throws you know uh, an office, a storefront, or something in two or three other places. But he's the only surveyor, uh, you know. And that's that's where that that thirty hour deal came from. In this uh, yeah. was a carryover, so, so that you know it basically says, hey, look. You know, you're not working 90 hours in three offices. You know, that's just right. not, you know, it's not happening. We know what you're doing. You've got a field crew over here in this other little old town, and they're doing all your work, and you're just stamping it. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what we don't want. Right. And, and basically, th this scenario helps the board, in my mind, head off uh, potential disciplinary actions. Right. I mean, I think that we can state the policy of the board perhaps, but that in the future we may want to consider changing only officers and principals language to something like, well, maybe saying only officers 
and principals or uh, registrant, you know, that are employed full time, a minimum of, uh, you know, 30 hours per week, because that way you're encompassing what you meant to encompass by saying, okay, well, you're not in violation if you are a licensed land surveyor and you're employed here 30 hours a week and you're in responsible charge. Um, and I would probably leave in the language in responsible charge because, uh, you know, if you had an office with more than one, obviously more than one registrant, then someone has to be <laughs> in charge. And that's the way our form, the form that goes for the, the business registration in, in the next uh, the next section right there. That's the way the form is structured. In other words, right. it, it says if, you know, one, two, three business, who the surveyor is. Right. And that registrant's name needs to be on that form. But he's not necessarily an owner in charge of that particular function in that office. Right. So I was just looking I mean, at I mean, I yield to your judgment. I think you clearly understand the question. Yeah. And I yield to your judgment how we need to move forward with this. Josh, can I uh, can I request that, and obviously you're not going to be able to do this right here, right now, I'm not asking you to, but uh, yeah. perhaps at our next meeting that we ask you to come back to us at the next meeting with, with a suggestion uh, that's allowed you to have time to study and, yeah. and well, I was just weigh looking. some options to come back with us on, yeah. on maybe I mean, a suggestion I think, on how to handle this. Yeah, I mean, it obviously I, it's creating some confusion. No, I mean, make it clear. yeah, I mean, I think that uh, stating, you know, the policy today and then, I can come back with the draft language for the rule next time and get that ball rolling. I, I don't know if it if it needs to be necessarily a rule, or perhaps it could be clarified with a board policy, perhaps, which would be a, you know a little yeah. less effort as, as opposed to going through the whole rules procedure. But you know, perhaps as a board policy, you know, as to, you know, principles shall be defined by this board or understood by this board. Yeah. We can't do we, we can't. can't do policies. Okay. Yeah, we're getting away from. Policies well, as far way, back, as back to back it up. What, I, what I'm yeah. requesting from you is, is at our next meeting, I'm going to ask you specifically to come back and address this issue. It's creating confusion. I, I hear the same thing in, in the west side of the state. So I've gotten the same phone calls, same questions uh, when it comes that time of year to fill that form out. What do you mean by a principal? Well, I'm not, you know, quote, a principal of the firm, nor am I an officer, you know. Valid question, and, and we need to address it. Yeah. Uh, so right I, I now, right now, I would just say the answer is the full-time registrant. You know, yes. we all understand. Right. You know, we understand yeah. what, yeah. what yeah. right, we mean right. By it. it yeah. just, I think the verbiage just didn't come out right. 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 Now, Cole, I'd like to follow up on that. If the board cannot have policies, and I know we don't want to have many policies, but if a board cannot have policies, how does a board? Uh, sometimes explain uh, a rule or statute or something because it is not a policy a clarification of the language as stated uh, as written policies can be used to clarify to staff how to do something uh, it can only be expect or restrict staff not you be used in any way so if the if you are essentially crafting new or a word other than rules. other than rules <laughs> there's a, no if, synonym for that so if you're crafting a policy it needs to be crafted into a rule it needs to be a rule right rather than you can't use you say. can't use policy uh, in, yeah. in lieu of rules I was only suggesting that that we craft a, a policy as a clarification not to change the rule I'm not trying to change the rule I'm just trying to clarify the I board's understanding of the word principle that's, that's what all I thought I'm trying the to do, and that would not—that that would not affect. I thought that's what policy did. That's what right. I thought, and that would not affect the applicant. They're still under the rules. Legally, they're under the rules. 
But in terms of administratively, it explains what that means. It, it would explain what the board understands the word principle to be defined as. Right. That, that's that's all I'm saying. Right, right. but that's if that's all I'm saying. If someone wanted to contest it, though, go back to the rules. It le it leaves you in a, a a weak legal position. It would be better to have it in a rule. Yeah, I mean that's what I was saying because if I read that as a lawyer and it just says only officers and principals, then I'm reading that as then you have to be an officer or principal of the company. And that's the problem. So we're down to back and forth as to what's your definition, what's my definition of a principal. That's why I'm saying and board if, policy is. Yeah, it um, policies can only affect me and me and Dennis. So if you want to say Nicole, you know, essentially the board's policy is that your applications will be processed in five days. They will be done. <laughs> 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 so that's. A, that can be a board policy. If you want to say that you could that you could have done the exam thing by policy. The exams will be handled administratively. Policy. Because you are it's not affecting the licensees. You're not restricting their ability to take a test. <laughs> You're just saying, Nicole, make it happen. <laughs> but if you uh, if you're going to do anything that's going to harm, restrict, limit, or potentially be contestable, you want that in a law or a rule, because otherwise it's up for legal challenge. Yeah. I mean, it hadn't been tested yet, so we're okay. But right, we're right, just right. saying, and you know, in all likelihood, it probably won't be tested. Right. But we just need to have it clarified, and if and if clarification means revise the the rule. Then let's do that. Right. And 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 that's why I. Your marching orders are prepare us a. Right. A, a, yeah. A revision. And I can do that. So we. Mm -hmm. uh, at least take a look at that next meeting. Rule doesn't read well enough that that everybody understands what that word means or everyone understands what that rule means. Then that rule needs fixed, in my opinion. I go back to uh, something that was given to me by staff. It says policy statements are adopted to enhance or clarify laws and rules. Clarify laws and rules. Any changes to laws and rules contradictory to the above supersedes policies. That's what staff gave me, and that's where I hang my hat until staff gives me something different. Policy is that that principal can apply to whoever is in charge runs the company, but runs that particular section. Right. And until we have, tell us how to fix it, Josh, and we're all behind you. Yeah, I mean, I think that's you're that. okay. Oh, I think you're. It. That's the yeah. goal. Let's fix right. it. Right. Okay. If it's broke. Let's fix it. <laughs> okay. That language changed drafted for you and bring it at the next meeting. Okay. Well, look, we've been running an hour plus, and I know it's probably time real quickly to uh, take a, a quick break and then come back here in about five minutes. Hmm. Now 10, 15, we're going to resume our meeting. Okay. Okay. Let's, uh, let's see. Josh went out in a rush, so I guess maybe he'll he'll rush right back here in just a minute, but I don't know of anything. I think the next thing that we needed to discuss and that we started yesterday, and that is uh, dealing with the GPS. So let's continue our discussion and what we need to do with that. Uh, Tim or Jay? Or Jay. Uh, the only thing I would add to yesterday's discussion is I did have an opportunity to look at uh, some of the information that the state of North Carolina adds. Which, which I have no no issue with. I th in fact, I'm somewhat in favor of now, to be quite honest with you. Uh, other than uh, I think I think North Carolina does have a, a, a brief sentence on there about a certificate I certified too or something. Tim, you may have it right there in front of you. Uh, I, I would like to kind of shy away or stay away from another certification on the survey. Um, and my reasoning behind that, my personal reasoning is that is that my stamp and signature and date on there is my certification. 
uh, and that everything on the face of that plat, notes included, uh, are contained within that uh, certification implied by the, the stamp. Um, and so just ha having more verbiage about what I certify to is, is already there. Um, so I, so I, I, like, I like the information that they're suggesting on, on theirs. Um, I'd like to incorporate that in the Tennessee as well, uh, just without the uh, certification on there. And, and Tim, if you have a chance to read it, that'd be good. Uh, two items that they include, uh, Jay, also. In North Carolina, they have a class of GPS surveys. Mm -hmm. We obviously don't have that, so right. I think that that item should be eliminated. Right. Uh, I've yet to wrap my arms around uh, number nine on here, which says units. I, I've, I've not wrapped my arms around because they, they give no definition of that. I, I assume they're, they're referring to uh, units of measure being feet, meters, whatever, uh, which is already on the face of your survey, I think. Right, so right. I, um, so, um, I mean, they go on to speak about, uh, you know, 95% confidence level, positional accuracy. They speak about some other things that we may or may want to include. Um, my notion would be uh, that we should formulate a, I don't want to call it a document, but a piece of paper that has this written on it mm -hmm. in the format that we're comfortable with, you know, eliminating the, the certificate right. and a couple right. of these other items. And and then on that base, uh, we officially adopted probably because I'm like you, I think the things that they asked for as whether it was, you know, static or, or real time, you know, uh, when it was done, what the datum is, you know, the confined scale factor, the geoid, all of these things are valuable data mm -hmm. so that that GPS survey can be recreated at some point in time in the future. Mm -hmm. That would be my suggestion. I'm sorry, what are you proposing to adopt at the next meeting? Well, we have in our rules in our standards of practice, under GPS surveying, it says, and I'll quote in just a moment, and this is what we discussed yesterday. Mm -hmm. It says, um, under rule 0820-03-.07, uh, paragraph five, subparagraph A and subparagraph um, one and two, it says the, uh, I'm sorry, subparagraph two, says the uh, land surveyor, and, and one and two, the land surveyor must use the current GPS standards as set by the board. And we are setting the current GPS standards, which means uh, in a very simple nutshell, Ms. Nicole, is there's a notation that the surveyor will have to put on his plat if he uses GPS equipment. And that notation will include these items that we're discussing um, and all registrants will do that so that their work can be recreated by another registrant okay. well, um, I I hate to, to I really hate to stretch anything out longer but I, I think Josh needs to analyze this because it might need be it it might need to be something that, that could be considered for rules I don't know if it can just be something we adopt and post on the website so that has I, I want Josh to, Josh to hear that what you said just what you said and consider it before the board takes any action or proposes it at the next meeting or whatever welcome back Josh we missed you sorry <laughs> I apologize for being late um, what we are discussing is um, in our standards of practice uh, rule 0820-03 dash point oh seven paragraph five subparagraph a and subparagraphs or subsections one and two specifically state in regards to global positioning system surveys gps is an acronym that the land surveyor must use the current gps standards as set by the board that's what it specifically says now the reason behind that josh is that when these standards were crafted, GPS, uh, being the technology that it is, is somewhat of a continual moving target from the standpoint of uh, NGS, 
uh, is constantly working to update and modify uh, the things that are necessary for a surveyor to use in GPS, for example, such as datum, such as geoid models, things of this nature. These things are, are manipulated uh, depending upon what they feel like. For example, we mentioned yesterday when Mr. Cleveland was here that there's a new uh, datum that they're looking at for 2022. So since, since we knew when these standards of practice went into effect in 2011, we knew that this was a moving target per se. Uh, we felt that it'd be most appropriate that the board be able to have the flexibility to be able to modify those standards from time to time as the standards that deal with GPS are modified by others, in this particular case, the federal government. So what we are proposing to do is we have looked at other states, information that, that other states uh, uh, require to put on their plats, um, and we've kind of come to a consensus of what we would like to use while you were out of the room, uh, what we would like to use as the standards as set forth by the board. Okay. And uh, what I recommended, because we're not using, we're using uh, an excerpt from North Carolina, and we're not using it carte blanche from A to Z, uh, what I recommended was that we uh, type up exactly you know, what we're going to use uh, and then officially approve it at our next meeting. And uh, where Miss Nicole was coming from, she wanted to make sure that we weren't making a rule or if we needed to make a rule or whatever, you know, whatever it is, she wanted your purview to, to tell us that we can do what our standards uh, directs us to do. Um, I mean, as always, I think I feel more comfortable if something like that is in a rule. Um, as, I mean, like all the other standards of practice, uh, as I can see an instance where if we were gonna discipline, for instance, a, a licensee for not following or using the proper whatever the board's wanting to adopt as far as the GPS uh, standards, then that could be challenged if it isn't in a rule. Is that where you're coming from? I mean, it, yeah, it seems like I understand that it gives you the option to do that, and I know it gives you flexibility, but it seems like the licensees would be trying to hit a moving target, and if it's in the rule, it's a rule, and everyone's expected to perform to that standard. Well, the, where I find it problematic is we went through a two-year process with our legal department prior to your coming, Josh, also with the AG's office. And I'm sure, Josh, you're very well aware of how thorough those folks are. They might not always understand everything, but they're very thorough. Uh, and these things came back and forth and back and forth. And the final rendition is what you see as you read it published as I read it. And therefore, it's my opinion that with all of the legal minds of the state of Tennessee having approved this and then these being signed off on and put into law for us to do, uh, it's my opinion that they intended to give us that ability to do exactly what that says. Now, if, you know, if your legal folks say something different, that's fine. But I think that all the legal eyes at that time uh, wore this thing out, just as we did, as direct as possible. Uh, and because of the nature of this particular technology uh, and tool that we're speaking about right here, uh, it's, it's imperative that the board maintain flexibility in order to, uh, to do this from time to time. This is not something I can tell you that what we're proposing to use for the registrants, I would not anticipate even, re and, and certainly Jay and Galen jump in on this, but I wouldn't anticipate revisiting this for a very significant period of time. I'm, I'm talking about years. Yeah, I hope not to. 
some point in time, it, I would think that, that it would be a situation where we need to have this in hand because here, here's my concern, Josh. Mm -hmm. We have been very fortunate not have had any complaints, complaints yeah. whatsoever relative to GPS surveying to date, to my knowledge, okay? And without this, without this, we have no means of disciplining a registrant who does not perform properly using GPS. I think it's inherent that we have something and if it's necessary to eventually incorporate it back into rule, then I have no problem with that. But I think, I think that from the spirit of us protecting the public from a registrant doing something incorrect with GPS, we don't have a leg stand on today. Fighting an uphill battle that, that right. we can't get to the top of the hill. Yeah. That's not a good situation. Because we have people out here that think that if they turn their telephone on and they get numbers on there because it's it has some kind of GPS control with it, that those numbers mean something, and they're, I mean exact, they're right to the pinpoint, and that's not even close to what it is. Yeah. I, I will say, uh, and, I, and I think because of the technology, uh, the reason we haven't had complaints is because of the accuracy of the technology that That creates a problem, but I think that the, the technology itself Right, and I mean I understand where the board is coming from because of the long uh, nature of the process of making new rules um, what the solution is other well, than to state I mean I, maybe uh, we should table this uh, you were already proposing it it be at the next meeting well the problem the problem I have with it I'm not even comfortable with actually proposing it for the next meeting because we started this last April and we ain't got it done yet and these regulations have been in effect since 2011 so we're already as far as I'm concerned we're four years behind and whatever to get somebody's attention it's going to take whatever because we need this you need it from the legal side because you may get a complaint Monday yeah, I mean very just... thing and then, and then you or your complaint reviewer can't do a thing right and it be and it be the most egregious situation that's ever happened but you can't do nothing well, I, th I think what we have here is, is a task on both sides number one the task on on the board side the us, us collectively us is to be able to draft those GPS standards that's what we're trying to accomplish right there by the by the discussion we had earlier I think administratively I think they have an assignment here to how can we administer most efficiently to get those standards set mm -hmm. to where they're enforceable right. right so we both have something to do here so, all right yeah we're obviously agree. trying to take our steps here to get this ink on paper here are the here are the standards here yeah let I us mean, hand those to you and then y'all need to figure out how can we most efficiently, quickly, expeditiously get these to where they're in an enforceable position such that comes through, we've got something to stand by that we've done our job. Right. Here are the standards. Right. Y'all can say we did our job, they're enforceable, and now let the board make decisions based on that. Now whether that's through rules or through some other mechanism, I'm, in, I'm instructing the administration to find what's most efficient to get that enforceable. If it's not enforceable, it's not worth the ink that it's on the paper. Right. We've got to make sure it's there. That's exactly right. If it means it has to go through the rules policy, I, I don't like it, but that's the way it works, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. If there's a more efficient way to get it through, we're asking you guys to find that way. My mm -hmm. question to you, Josh, would be can you query the AG about that particular statement and about how it's to be? I mean, I can inquire as to what we can do about it. Um, you know, it'll probably be next meeting before I can get that answer. But if the board can get if the board can get the standards for me, because obviously I don't know anything about GPS 
but I mean, I'm just saying if the board gives me what they want the standards to be, then we can expeditiously do what we need to do on our side. It'd probably be more efficient to take it to chief counsel in, in yeah. commerce and insurance than trying to take it to outside attorney general who will put it behind Seven million cases of, of crimes and I'm just trying to get the point. You know, I understand. Do we have somebody we can get an answer? Yeah, well, that's what I'm, I'm saying by saying you. I can take it to yeah. someone and get the answer because no, I don't think it's an attorney general's yeah. opinion <laughs> usually takes <laughs> six months. Down, downstairs, I don't care. Yeah. Get an answer. Right. You will just be frustrated with me when I'm telling you six months later we still haven't gotten the attorney general. So basically what I'm hearing is you want me to go ahead and, and polish these up Email them to Jay and Galen and Sue and see if they're happy with what words are there. Send it to you. No, no sir. No. If you if you want to work on this now and during the board meeting, um, vote on it. Give it to us today. We will take it to administration and figure out how we need to handle it. Move it forward. Because outside the meeting, you can't. Email you can't, you can't. individual board would, members and that would be conducting board business in violation, in violation of the Sunshine, of the Sunshine Law. Act. Well, let me ask this because I, I have a little. On this particular issue. You can't discuss board business outside of a noticed meeting without being in violation of the Sunshine Act. All board business has to be conducted out in the open is the problem. Important topic to you. If this is important to you, this is the time then this is the time to do it. I don't have any problem marking up marking up a draft or something for you to talk to somebody that can get us an answer. An answer. We're four years overdue. Right. From from that standpoint, I don't have that problem. So you just want to de you know deputize Mr. Lingerfelt to handle that for the board? I'll give you the form and you mark out what you don't like and then we'll discuss it. How's that? Can you submit? That's fine. Yeah. We can do that. We'll discuss it and give it to them. I can write on this, you're okay. You write all over it. Nah. It's the only copy I got, so <laughs> don't overwrite on it. <laughs> Would you like to have another copy made so we do that, Dennis? It'd be good. All right. In the meantime, let's move on. Hey, uh, let's see. The next thing we had was, um, uh, did we need to, to revisit anything on the non-monumented? Uh, the discussion of the Kentucky's method to define all surveying related tasks. Uh, Actually, I'm going to refer that over to. I'm, I'm not. I, I don't know. It's since I'm not licensed in Kentucky, and I have nor am I dealt with them. <laughs> oh, I thought you were. No, okay. sir. Tell me this. I do know that they, they had a definition of surveying. Is that the term? Yeah. Their definition of surveying, I think, it had some some interesting points in there. Basically, what they were trying to do, they were trying to. Uh, clarify um, their inclusions and, and exclusions of surveying was what they were trying to clarify. Jurisdictional boards are having trouble because of new technology, uh, well, newer technology. 
such as uh, GIS, uh, things of that nature, where other, um, let's say, professions, for lack of a better term, are impeding, thank you, Dennis, impeding or overstepping their bounds into the surveying world. And what Kentucky did was they sat down and reviewed their standards of practice and came back and said that these are the things that are in our standards of practice and that we feel like that is under the purview of our board. That's basically what they did. Um, and they did it in a concise manner, which I'm not finding my form right now for some reason, but they did it in a very uh, concise manner such that they could publish it on their website so that it was very clear to the registrants. And I don't seem to find that. That's basically what, what they tried to accomplish with that. And I think sometimes that uh, that that scenario has some merit. But uh, it's apparent from how we have to do things.
looking at the point vertically, if this was, say, a moment. Basically, it's the value of the base. That's the real elevation where you could actually be reading something here, reading it. something here, um, because down at that I mean, point, and, that that and that's the that's real truth. That's the, right. And that's fine. we call positional accuracy that's that's all positional accuracy means is 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 from the information how close are you really to that point that's all that means and they use what they call in here a 95 percent confidence level is what they use so you We, Jay and I, we, we kind of, we marked the same thing because I was looking. And see if you have any problem with that. Well, I think we're virtually the same thing. We exactly. <coughs> yeah. We're all right with that. Just pass that on to the powers that be. Yeah. Yes, it's the first thing that came out. I'm good, yeah. All right, there you go. Did our part. Okay. I'm good. Appreciate that. Now, do we need to have a motion about that or anything? Or opt and then that way you can formally work on it? Why don't you, why don't you do that, please? Okay. That's no problem. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll make a motion that the document uh, that I have marked up and has now been passed to our attorney, Mr. Kilgore, uh, be a representation of what the board would like to see uh, on subsequent uh, GPS uh, survey plats. I understand that that's to be defined as what we refer to in the rules as the GPS standards. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Very good. Second that. All right. Motion made and second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Passes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, anything else that we need to deal with? Topic of discussion, was it? Yeah, not? just topic yeah. of discussion. I didn't think there was anything really to go with it. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay.
old, old business. I, at least I think I have covered that. If I haven't, then that's what. Well, Mr. Chair, we need to uh, uh, speak to PDHs for the meeting. Yes. Total should be seven. Total should be seven PDHs. That, uh, is that inclusive of yesterday and today? Is that correct, Yes, Tim? sir. Yep. Next motion I will entertain is a motion to adjourn. I don't want any opposition. <laughs> motion to adjourn. Oops. I asked Doug to get that text. Do what? I get it. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion. Otherwise, we